Uh, just a few minutes past noon, so we will go ahead and uh, call this meeting to order. And before we begin, I would like to welcome this month's Leadership Development Program participants. We're really happy to have you here with us today. And if you would please stand, introduce yourself, uh, tell us how, how long that you have been with KUB and which department you are. Uh, Brad Bates, I've been with KUB for 12 years and I'm in the meter systems department. I'm Brian Kraft, I've been at KUB 11 years and I'm in key accounts. My name is Adam Crocker, I've been with KUB for three years and I'm with communications infrastructure. My name is Chastity Hobby, I've been with KUB for three years and I work in safety and regulatory services. Andy Loveday, I've been with KUB for three and a half years and in storerooms. Jonathan Parker, I've been with KUB just over a year and I'm in properties. I'm Stephanie Talent, I've been with KUB for six years and I work in customer experience. Okay. We also have some guests uh, with us today from KUB's overhead construction department. And we're going to hear from uh, more about them and one of their programs later in the meeting. But I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you also for joining with us today. Glad you're here. Um, Mr. Coley, if you would note that all commissioners are present except uh, Commissioner Herbert, who is absent today. First item on our agenda is approval of the January 16, 2020 minutes. Those were mailed to you. Uh, take a motion for approval or any corrections that anyone may have. Move to approve. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Minutes are approved. For uh, our first official action today, we have resolution number 1409 requesting city council approval of refunding bond issues for the electric, gas, water, and wastewater division. Okay. Yeah. Commissioners, we have identified an opportunity to refinance existing bonds as a result of some savings to our customers. I would like to ask Mark Walker to go over those, those details. Good afternoon, Commissioners. We do bring you some good news today from the financial world and that we have identified a relatively large number of um, outstanding bonds that were sold about 10 years ago that are getting ready to um, have their call provisions uh, to be effective and we there are opportunities to refinance these bonds at lower rates and save our customers a considerable amount of money over the life of the bonds specifically we've identified a little over 77 million dollars in bonds that were sold back in 2010 and 2011 that includes about 17 million dollars in electric bonds 9.7 million in gas bonds 20.6 million in water bonds and 30 million in wastewater bonds. And based upon the current interest rate environment, the refinancing, we're estimating a savings of about $24 million over the life of the bonds, which would make it one of the largest refinancing savings um, in, in my tenure here at KUB. So we're excited about that. I do want to point out that the maturities of the debt will not be extended as a result of this. Actually, the life of the debt will be um, shortened uh, slightly for this. Uh, typically, when we refinance, we follow the same maturity schedule that's already in place with the outstanding bonds. An exception to that this time is with wastewater. We're actually going to modify the amortization structure in place, and we'll talk about that here in just a few more minutes. But that does add considerably to the savings for the wastewater bonds. We do have refunding plans that we are required to submit to the State Comptroller's Office, actually the Office of State and Local Finance, for their review. Uh, the reports that we receive back, which are due in about 10 to 15 days, we will provide a copy of that to the Board. Uh, City Council authorization, of course, is required for the issuance and sale of the refunding bonds. We anticipate going to Council for their approval in late March, and we're targeting a sale date probably of mid-April. Looking at some of the summary information on each of the refunding bond series, one thing I do want to point out to you, um, if you look at the various amount of bonds that we would issue, they total 78.6 million. That is more than the bonds that are being refinanced, and that's because 
the cost of issuance, and also the underwriter fees are part of the bond proceeds, so it's always going to be a little bit higher. I'll also point out to you the average projected rates on the new bonds uh, from a low of 209 to a high of 2.85 percent, and you compare that to the average bonds on those that are being refunded, and you have a spread of anywhere from 115 basis points for water to 188 basis points for electric. And it does produce these levels of savings over the life of the bonds, 24 million total, but 18 million or about three-fourths of that is in wastewater. And wastewater savings, again, will come from lower interest rates, that difference, but it's also gonna come from changing the debt service schedule. And again, we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Going through each of the series of bonds, starting with electric, proposing to sell 17.4 million in electric revenue refunding bonds, that'll pay off the existing bonds of 17.1 million, covers the issuance cost and underwriter fees. The maturity schedule's essentially replicated for what's being refinanced. They'll fully mature in 2030. The savings over the life of that, for the next 10 years or over the life of the bonds, 1.6 million, it's about $160,000 per year for 10 years. So that's electric. Gas, 9.8 million in refunding bonds, or refinance or pay off 9.7 million in existing debt, cover issuance costs, underwriter fees as well. Same maturity schedule, bonds will fully mature in March of 2032 with a savings of about 1.1 million. Water, 21 million in water refunding bonds, pay off 20,600,000 of existing debt, cover the fees and issuance cost as well. And you can see the maturity schedule. This is a little bit longer debt, 2040 full maturity. Um, we backloaded this principle somewhat back in 2011 when we sold the bonds. And that was as we were restarting Century 2 for the water system after the economic recession, looking for some cash flow flexibility. So we put more of the principal on the back end. We're not proposing to, to change that with this schedule. $3.2 million in savings over the life of the bonds. And then finally, with wastewater, $30,400,000 to issue, pay off $30 million in existing debt. Now this is a little bit different. You see two graphs on the right-hand side of the chart. First of all is the current debt service. These are the bonds that are being refunded. This is the current amortization schedule. This was actually 35-year debt sold back in 2010, so it matured out through 2045. But we backloaded the principal on this. All the principal came due in the final three years. Two reasons for that back in 2010. One, we were still four or five years, we were four or five years into the consent decree. Still had a lot of major projects on the front end. We were looking for cash flow flexibility. So we pushed the principal to the back. Also at the time, the yield curve was relatively flat. So meaning you didn't have a lot of interest rate differential depending upon the maturity of the bonds. So we backloaded that. With the refunding that we're proposing to change that and the projected debt service for the refunding is levelized, which is what we typically do with our bond series, unless there's a reason not to. So we're going to issue levelized and you can see we're going to pay a little bit more. It's hard to see because of numbers, but a little bit more per year for the first 20 years, a few hundred thousand per year. But on the back end of it, you can see all this principal is actually being amortized over this remaining 24, 25 years, as opposed to the last three years. You're saving $27 million in debt service costs on those last three years. Now you're gonna pay a little bit more on the front end, save a lot on the back end. We think that's the best way to do it. We make decisions, financial decisions, for our customers, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. So we think this is the best, um, debt service structure for the refunding bonds, and it adds considerably to the savings for our customers. Yes, sir? So, we backloaded both water, wastewater <coughs> and water. They were issued at different times. Yes, at sir. different times, but they're both back, they were originally both backloaded, but I see here, you levelized wastewater, but if I, if I go back to the water, we, didn't did water. Not, we did not levelize. We did not levelize water. Well, the reason what? for that is water plants very tight. I don't want to take 
I think we can manage this on wastewater, adding a little bit of debt service cost each year. Right. I don't want to take four or five hundred thousand dollars away from the water system here in the next five to ten years. I don't think it's the best. We didn't think it was the best approach to levelize water. That's a good question. Okay. Question. So, uh, some of these bonds that we're looking at, you know, twenty plus years to pay back. How how do these savings affect our uh, our budget on an annual basis? Have we got some additional. I mean, how does it how does it spread out on a well, for example, for electric, we were saving 1.6 million. That's 160 thousand dollars a year. Okay, so that we'll factor that into our our planning process. For water, that 3.2 million. That's over about 20 years. So that's about 160 thousand dollars per year. Gas, 1.1 million over 11 years. So it's about 100 thousand per year. Uh, so it helps. And, and the wastewater, which that was the line I was most. And wastewater is going to add. To our plan for the for the first 20 years, we're going to pay three to four hundred thousand dollars more per year in debt service. Okay. But we're going to manage that. I, I'm not going to. We're not going to raise rates more as a result okay. of that. Uh, we can manage that. But having 27 million dollars in, in savings on those last three years, it's as we said and we talked about in staff. It's hard to walk away from that. So I think that's the best approach. So essentially, what we had was a, a balloon payment. We had, mm -hmm. and, yes. And we're taking that away. That's correct. Um, not doing that on water, I, I trust your judgment uh, on it, uh, but on, not doing it on water, I guess if it were, in, in my mind, I'm thinking at the rates we're getting, we're probably not going to get lower rates. I mean, it, it's hard, I'd be hard pressed to, to see lower rates in the future. So do you anticipate at some point we might refund, uh, refinance those, those balloon payments later on or is that something we just need to be planning for because that's going to be a big hit at some point the balloon payments for water water yeah. Mr. Uh, mm -hmm. sorry. could you go back to to water yes sir okay there we go <clears throat> that will be an opportunity now a couple of things there one is um, these bonds the refunding bonds will have call provisions as well but those calls are typically nine to ten years out so for water we will have that opportunity come 2030-2031. The we used to have the ability the, to... The interest rates will be yeah. at that time. So that's yeah. right. Okay, I got you. And we used to have the ability to advance refund where you could do it like two years in advance, mm -hmm. but that was taken away in recent legislation. Okay. Good question. <laughs> um, also wanted to share with the board... One other question. I should know this. I just can't remember. Um, in terms of impact on budget, uh, in the budget there's uh, there's interest expense, not debt yes, service expense, mm -hmm. uh, as, as a budget line item. The principal that we pay back is that does that come out of the same budget line or does it? Yes. It, okay. Yeah. Right. So it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter whether it's interest or, or principal That's from a correct. cash perspective. That's correct. Okay. Looking at the um, estimated professional fees in total, about $500,000. You can see it listed by the various firms that, that are used to help facilitate the issuance and sale of the bonds. I'll point out that the fees for our financial advisor, Cumberland Securities and Bond Council, best variance sims are established per contract, so we know what those amounts are going to be based upon the par value of the bonds. The rating agency fees are estimates based upon historical transactions. We're somewhat at their mercy for that, and, um, but that's our estimate around $100,000 each for that. So in total, $500,000, <coughs> that represents about 60 basis points on the par value that's competitive and consistent with past transactions. Some of the key provisions of the authorizing bond resolutions, obviously they authorize the, collectively the issuance of the revenue for funding bonds totaling $78.6 million. The bonds are secured solely by the issuing system's revenues, which means electric system revenue. Electric bonds can only be satisfied by electric system revenue and so forth. That's a key point when we talk to city council, because the bonds are issued in the name of the city. And we want to make sure that they understand that the bondholders have no recourse 
uh, against the city for repayment. So that's always a point we bring up. <coughs> uh, the bonds are issued on a parity basis, which simply means the new bondholders have the same repayment rights as the existing bondholders, no preference there. And we will be using a refunding escrow agreement for electric. That's because the call date on the existing electric bonds to be refinanced is until July 1st. And we will sell and close a couple of months prior to that. So we'll do an escrow for a couple of months on that. And then in closing, Resolution 1409, um, basically the board is authorizing the, the issuance and sale of the refunding bonds and requesting city council to, to do likewise. And that's my report. I'll be happy to answer any more questions. Great news. Any other questions? Yeah, we need. We will need a motion and a second for resolution 1409. So moved. Second. Mr. Cullen, will you do a roll call, please? Mr. Askew. Aye. Mr. Hamilton. Aye. Mr. Finnell. Aye. Mr. Simpson Brown. Aye. Mr. Small. Aye. Mr. Warden. Aye. And Mr. Herbert is at resolution 1409 is passed. All right, next on our agenda is the President's Report. Commissioners, last month Mike Bowen gave you a preview of a new gas program we have called Easy Connect. I would like to introduce John Petrowski, Manager of New Service, to give you more details on the program. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Commissioner, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, uh, over the last several years, We've been working to develop uh, programs and strategies to help us grow our natural gas system. And for example, a couple of years ago, we implemented a natural gas water heater program that, among other things, uh, was intended to help us learn about gas appliance installations. And around that same time, we also introduced a natural gas appliance rebate program intended to help uh, provide some incentive for our customers to uh, transition from electric or propane appliances to natural gas. And then during this time, we've also uh, taken some efforts and steps uh, to be more diligent, uh, a little bit more strategic about how we grow our gas system and where we grow our gas system. Uh, we're always looking for unserved areas, underserved areas, as well as areas that are uh, growing and developing. And then, a little, I guess more recently, uh, we've also undertaken an effort to, to uh, develop a branding strategy for our natural gas programs. And so we've come up with a, with a, a theme called Connect to Comfort. Uh, it's going to serve as a tagline uh, for all of our natural gas programs. <coughs> and so while the programs themselves will have their own specific identity and their own marketing plans, uh, all these programs will roll up underneath the umbrella theme of Connect to Comfort. So uh, I guess as in the process of collecting data to develop and support these programs, uh, we discovered something. We discovered that uh, we have a whole lot of residential homes on our natural gas system um, that are close to, to existing gas mains but not connected to the system. Um, we estimate we have 25 to 30,000 residential homes that are within 200 feet of an existing natural gas main but not connected to the system. So obviously uh, that presents us with a great opportunity which is why I'm here today uh, to introduce a new program we've developed called Easy Connect. So what is Easy Connect? It's really a, a very simple concept. It's got four key components to it. Um, number one, we're going to target those homes that are within 200 feet of an existing gas main but not connected. And we're going to offer them a turnkey installation of a natural gas service and a natural gas water heater. Uh, at that point, the appliance and the, and the appliance installation cost will become eligible for on-bill financing. And then when all is said and done, we will have a customer that has established gas service with us and is now eligible to participate in our rebate program. So that's a really high-level overview of the program. So now I want to talk a little bit more in detail about uh, several of the components of the program. So our marketing approach. Um, so before we can go out and talk to anybody about this program, we really need to know who they are and where they are. And when you're talking about a gas system that uh, spans almost 300 square miles, and we've got over 100,000 customers, it's a little difficult, a little challenging to find these folks. Uh, so we sat down with our business performance department 
and we developed a mapping tool that lets us take a closer look at our uh, gas service territory. And in particular, what this tool does is it lets us zoom in to specific areas on the system uh, so that we can see exactly where these folks live and then begin to develop uh, kind of customized marketing plans, communication plans. And so what you see here is an example of how this tool works. Uh, the orange lines that you see that are paralleling the roads uh, are existing gas mains. And then the shapes that are shaded in blue are homes uh, on the street that are not connected to the gas system. So it's these types of areas that we're going to target as part of this program. Okay, the turnkey installation. So from experience, we know that customers will incur incremental costs to transition from electric or propane to natural gas. There's really just no way around that. Um, so what we, what we want to do with this program is try to make that process as easy as possible because honestly it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty tricky process had a lot of moving parts difficult to navigate so our plan is to handle everything involved in that process from installing the gas service uh, to working with the local codes enforcement agencies uh, to installing the appliance and our hope is that by making that process easy for our customers that we're going to be providing them with some significant value Another thing that we feel pretty good about is that by performing this work with KUV crews as opposed to contractors, uh, we're going to achieve greater flexibility, uh, better ability to coordinate work amongst the groups, um, and also a better ability to control costs. Um, we also think there's a lot of value in, in having our gas installation crews, our meter installation crews, our appliance installation crews, our customer service reps all under one roof working together and talking with one another on a daily basis. We think long term that's going to be a key to our success. And then we want to start small, honestly. Uh, we're new to this. Uh, we want to get it right. Um, so we're going to start small in year one. We're going to focus really on process. Uh, ultimately, we want this to be a good experience for our customers. Uh, so we're going to keep it simple in year one and we're going to focus on water heaters only. And then one last quick note here. Um, you see uh, some pictures here of our uh, installation truck, and it's a nice new shiny wrap on the truck. It's been outfitted with all the tools and equipment our crews will need, uh, and it's ready to go. So not only is it a functional truck, it's also a promotional truck. And I guess we hope as our guys are driving through neighborhoods, uh, this will generate some interest and also direct customers to our website so they can learn more about our program. And then finally, on-bill financing. Again, this is in keeping with our, our philosophy, our goal here to make this easy and painless for the customer. Um, once that appliance installation is complete, uh, the appliance installation costs become eligible for on-bill financing at no additional charge or fee to the customer. Uh, those costs will just simply be placed on their KB bill. Um, financing, at this point in time, the initial terms will be 12 to 36 months depending upon the amount uh, to be financed. And again, we feel like this component of the program provides some additional flexibility for the customer. Uh, it's going to lessen the financial uh, burden on the front end for them as well. Uh, I feel pretty good about where we are on this. There, there are a few details we need to uh, tidy up a little bit. Um, we've also got to come up with a, a financing agreement for our customers, but I think we're pretty close on all those counts. And that brings me to our implementation schedule. Um, I guess late last year when we were winding up the uh, water heater program, we intentionally held back some work, uh, anticipating that the installation crew for this program would need some practice. Uh, so our intent right now is to get our crew up and running in March, begin practicing. Uh, they'll practice through the end of May. In March, we'll also begin to develop our initial list of targets for the rollout, as well as our marketing materials. Uh, right now, we anticipate a rollout, a soft rollout, in early summer um, and as I mentioned previously I think year one is really about the process and fine-tuning the process so uh, we're gonna make a, a conscious effort to control the pace of the work in year one um, and then we'll come back at the end of year one uh, do a thorough assessment of the program see where we're at and then identify the next steps so I guess that's it in a nutshell uh, appreciate your time if you got any questions I'd be happy to take them now. John, you said that the, the first year is going to be uh, control to the water heaters only. Yes. And that's your, that's kind of your test project. So 
would I be right in saying that this whole appliance and appliance installation financing going forward to anything besides water heaters is going to be dependent on the results, the evaluation of those results at the end of the first year. Yeah, and, and honestly, I think we feel pretty confident about our ability to do the work. I think really what we're trying to do in year one is, uh, you know, you start out with limited resources. Um, you want to make sure your processes are good. We want to make sure that the product is good. We want to make sure that the customer uh, is happy. So really it's just about filling, filling our way through it. I, I feel confident we're going to be okay, but you're right. I mean, this is really a, a kind of a pilot year for us to kind of work out the kinks and then when we get uh, our feet underneath us, I think we'll be ready to expand offerings beyond just the water heater. Okay. You know, uh, I, I, I like this, I like this, this concept. Um, I had three or four questions, or three or four thoughts, and, and, and I'll just uh, put them all out there. First of all, I, I would want us to, as we think about ident identifying areas, is to maybe look at some of our low income communities as we think about how to lessen their energy burden. Um, but then as we move forward, one of the other questions I had was, if it's on bill financing, will this be, will there be some cost prohibitive nature of this uh, so that those who are lower income or who spend a, a disproportionate amount of their, their, their take home pay on utilities would not be able to do this or not, will not want to do this. So that's my second thought. Um, and then my last thought is, are, are there potential opportunities to help subsidize some of our lower income communities and, and rate holders moving forward if we were to think about collectively how to, how to be creative about financing? So it's gonna all my thoughts into one. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, you know, the, the whole financing <coughs> issue is generated some conversations amongst, I know the executive staff. Um, the, the thing with financing is it's, it's, it's complicated if you go beyond no financing, no, no financing fees. So if you begin to charge financing fees, you, you open yourself to some regulatory things, um, some reporting requirements that become a little bit arduous. So I think we want to stay away from that. Uh, it, it's, as far as your questions about uh, low income areas, you know, um, I don't know. I'm not, I know we have programs that we're working on right now. Um, I know Veronica's involved with some of those. I thought so, if, after we get the map and we figure out where everybody is, if we if we want to target some areas and do some strategic mm -hmm. targeting, maybe sure. look at some of our lower income mm -hmm. communities first sure. um, to get, help lessen the energy burden on them. So. You know, in terms of that, it's just really looking at where we are, yeah, yeah. where we have the yeah. gas mains, and then seeing if we could, you know, yeah. do a soft roll. We have control first. over where we drive this right. and what we target. We have control over where we go and what we target. So Absolutely, we target. Yeah. So certain. Give me your initial numbers um, as far as how many, how many, um, how many uh, opportunities you have out there for people who have not connected yet. And that one slide that you showed it looked like maybe a third um, of the houses represented were. It, Potential. It's about twenty-five to thirty thousand total. Okay. Um, it's going to vary depending upon which subdivision, which area you go, you go into. Sure. Um, some it's going to be more. Some it's going to be, be less than this. A fair portion of that thirty thousand actually lies outside our electric system service territory and essentially goes into LCUBs. Um, so in the event that they convert, they're not losing an electric customer. Somebody else is. Or electric load, um, so you know it's about that's six, it's about six thousand. About six thousand, so about twenty percent or so. Uh, so. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, part of my question probably has already been answered, but um, so how did you come up with the twenty-five to thirty thousand? Did you just lay look at the whole city of Knoxville? And you determined that within the city there are twenty five to thirty thousand, or did you focus on particular areas of the city? No, we looked at our entire gas system, okay, uh, service territory, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I can't take credit for it. We have people who are a lot smarter than me who can write queries and pull data. <laughs> but, but basically, what we did is we fed uh, our computer system some criteria, and what we were looking for was homes that were within two hundred feet of a gas main, but were not a gas customer. Okay. Uh, so there's a way to extract that data. So we've we'll, we extracted that data, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's kind of messy data. So after we scrubbed it, mm -hmm. 
uh, we got it down to about 25 or 30,000 that we felt pretty good about. Okay. So that's just kind of scattered about our system. Mm -hmm. but the criteria was, is it a residential home? And is it within 200 feet of a gas main? So that's kind of how we, we approached it. I, this is more of a, a kind of a general uh, comment. We all believe, I think we all believe, that natural gas is a lot cleaner than coal and is preferable in that regard. Uh, we also know, though, with some recent research that's come out, that because of the redu reduction in the use of coal and the increase in the use of gas, that gas is contributing to the carbon footprint uh, in a much greater way than it ever has, just simply because we've increased its use. Uh, I hope we will take this opportunity as we expand to, to become the model uh, for, for utilities all over the world in making sure that our system doesn't leak. The, the quality control in how we hook up the houses, the quality control of how we hook to the mains and to the degree that we control the mains, which we do, to, to make sure that leakage from the mains is absolutely minimal. Uh, we can't control, most of this leakage is, that matters to the environment is coming out of the big long pipelines, I get that. But if we need to make sure that it, as we move to this, for all the right reasons, that we do it with the highest possible quality uh, as a priority uh, so that we don't contribute anything to the, uh, to the negative uh, environmental uh, uh, consequences. This is an intended to answer your question, but on a much smaller scale, uh, we are taking, we're going to great lengths to train our folks, um, working with the Coast Enforcement people. We had our water heater suppliers come in and perform training so that they know exactly what to do. So uh, to your point, we are making sure that when our guys go out, they know exactly what to do. And we're working in concert with the uh, Coast Enforcement agencies to make sure that the work is done. Thank you. That's exactly what I was hoping you were going to say. I anticipated you were already doing it, but I think, I think all of us care about the earth that our grandchildren are going to have and so I'm constantly looking this is an opportunity for us to put a little extra focus on it since we've got a new initiative make sure that the quality is always uh, at the top of the list. You know Jerry I was going to say we get a discount for the guys that are practicing when they're all learning. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's yeah. not what you meant. It doesn't work that way. It works that way for lawyers but not the <laughs> does say I'd like you to hook up more than just the water heater. Do you say no or do you say let me check? And it's funny you ask that question. We already get questions like that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that very question came up uh, you know not long ago if somebody just called up and said hey would you put this in for us? And that that's a good question um, and something we haven't really got our hands around just yet. But yeah. um, the answers for right now is not yet. Yeah. yeah. I mean mm -hmm. We won't get there. We won't get there at the right time. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a process. It's a slow process. I mean, we've talked about this for a while, uh, but we're slowly getting there. Thank you, John. I, I love this program for for a lot of reasons, um, but I think the main one is this is just a great proactive growth kind of program where um, you know we're. We've identified a, a place that we can we can sort of grow the system um, because you know we sit in all these finance meetings and, and running a, a running these utilities is incredibly expensive and um, so having a, a proactive growth initiative where we're going to target folks that have, may have always wanted this kind of service but didn't have a didn't have an easy mechanism and I, I just I just want to commend you and your team for that. And also, I love that this isn't. We're doing this internally. It, a lot of times, when I get negative feedback on on the utility, when you dig further, you find out it's not KUB. It's one of our subcontractors. And so, having a crack team that's trained, and you're going to you're going to run through lots of examples to get it right, uh, and having that be the face of this program is, is, is ideal. So, thank you. Yeah. It is. One, one quick note, I, I didn't talk about it a lot, but um, when we did the National, Has the National Gas Water Heater Program, there was a lot of reasons we did the program, but one of them was what, uh, what, where you're going. We wanted to learn how to do it. We did it with contractors, so we got to see uh, both sides uh, of the equation. And I think in the final analysis, we determined that 
just from a, a, an efficiency standpoint, in house was definitely the way to go. So, last last question uh, okay. for me. Um, we're converting. I realize you said a lot of these people are on other other systems, which is always a net positive for us. Uh, but uh, uh, the have, have we done any kind of analysis to see what the impact on uh, on the bottom line for us is, which ultimately impacts the rate payers um, on having people convert from electric, which in our system. Uh, going from an electric water heater to a, a gas water heater, from uh, all of that, is it is it kind of a wash in terms of? Uh, well, of course, each each system stands on its yeah. own. So if somebody's converting, in particular on our electric system, you're going to lose a little bit of electric margin. Mm -hmm. For a water heater, that's going to be inconsequential. Right. If you're talking about a uh, heat load or a, a, a furnace, a heat pump converting to a gas furnace, then it's going to be a, a little bit more sizable. But you know we. We face that every day. I mean, yeah. customers, you know, have choice. Yeah. And, and for our gas system, we think that this is, you know, for current and future gas, potential gas system customers, you're just making it a little bit easier. And, but I, I, I'm not concerned, I okay. guess I should say, from a financial perspective. Okay, good. The other thing is, you know, as we all know, gas is an optional fuel. So, yeah. uh, you know, there, you have to kind of get creative because if you don't, um, then people just will go with the electric, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? You can tell we really engage with these new programs. That's what we, all, we, we talk to you all the most when you bring us something like this, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioners, as you are aware, KUB and CAC have been partners for over 35 years behind a, a program called Project Help help folks pay for winter heating assistance during the during the northern months. I've introduced one of our awesome customer counselors, Veronica Andrews, to give you an update on this on last year's results and this year's campaign. Thank you, Mr. Good afternoon, commissioners. Today I'm going to present an overview of Project Health, the results from our campaign. Oh, oh I'm yeah. sorry. Going the wrong way. Okay. I'm going to present um, an overview of Project Help, the results from our campaign, and share the impact of what we have with our customers. 37 years, Project Help has been providing emergency heating assistance for the working low-income family. We have done this graciously, and we have done this intentionally, and it covers every type source of heat. We are governed by community members. We have several community partners that have come on board so they can assist us with this important work that we have going on. We, we cannot do this without our partners, and we're going to see this uh, with the results of our campaign. So for Home Federal, Food City, and our partners that always promote our, uh, our campaign, we appreciate them. Over the last five years, Project Help has helped with more than $662,000 to serve over 2,200 families. That's remarkable, and it's intentional. You may also um, notice the variance in the family assistance year to year. And different causes, different things cause that variance. The weather can cause that variance. The family's need can cause that variance. And also funding availability. If CAC has federal funding available, we're gonna use that funding first. But if that customer is overqualified or does not qualify, then we have that project help to step right in and still assist them. Assist them. And although the number of families assisted varies, if you look at the average per household, that pretty much stay consistent. So we know we are helping with that critical need with the right amount of money. There's so many ways you can contribute. Of course, our annual campaign with local partners. It starts every January. It runs for four weeks. Our customers have an opportunity to sign up for monthly donations on their bill, 
and we have several opportunities to for our customers, friends, and neighbors to sign up for a one-time contribution. And just to share an exciting fact for you, last year we had 1,600 customers with KUB to pledge monthly to Project Help, and that totaled about an average of $6,000 a month. I thought that was awesome. So with that said, I am excited to announce that our campaign this past January 2020, we raised over $54,000. And that is the second highest amount of money raised for Project Help within the 37 year span. And again, I want to share with you in, in closing the impact that it has with our customers. This first letter is from a 42-year-old uh, female. She has a six-year-old daughter. She had unexpected expenses to show up. Plus, she was helping her nephew with funeral arrangements for his mom, who was her sister. She needed help. She didn't know where to go. We were able to step in and help her. The next um, appreciation letter was from a lady who was 59 years old. Life happened to her and her family. She had to make a crucial decision. She ended up moving in with her 41-year-old son because he was diagnosed, diagnosed with MS and could no longer work. So she did the best she can with what she had. And when she needed the help and came, she was discouraged. She didn't know if she could get help, but we were able to help her. So I just want to say, we have done this work intentionally for 37 years, and we plan to continue to do it as long as there's a need. Any questions? Thank you. I have, I have a question. Yes. So the, the amount raised, the $54,000, which is the second highest, is there a goal for every year to raise a certain amount, or is it, um, is it you just hope that the climate's good that people will give. As it has continued to go up for the last six years, we always try to set a goal, yeah. $50,000, at okay. least $50,000. So we try That's to great. set that goal. So we've been able to reach that goal and kind of hold it there. Mm -hmm. Now, and this is just a third of our campaign of Project Help. This is about a third of it. Between uh, customers giving monthly, one-time donations. Last year in 2019, we had a budget of $188,000. So it's impressive. People give, people love, people willing to help. And if we're there willing to help organize it and, and get it out there, we'll do it. And with partners, there's um, Food City. I mean, we've seen them before. Are there, is there a reason to engage new partners or um, others to make the you know, broader net? Or are these um, strategic alliances well, our members, the members of, that we're governed by, our board members are community members. Mm -hmm. So they're the people that live in the community, that's part of the community, that's part of CAC. So I'm pretty sure it'll be open to anyone who would want to partner with us. Yeah. We just, those yeah. have just been long standing yeah. relationships. Yeah. Very long standing. And Veronica, when we help folks, is this a part of, and I think I know the answer to this, but this is a part of a holistic effort, right? So if there are folks who may have chronic issues with paying their bills or other uh, other uh, life, life circumstances like you mentioned earlier, is this one part of a holistic effort that we use to help us help and support folks? Um, I know we have the customer care counselors, I know we have social workers, all of those things. And, and what we do it as, as customer counselors, we advocate this is part of a holistic approach. We have to look at the person and their environment on an individual basis. So we can work collaboratively with those agencies to right. say, hey, they may need this help, this help, this help. So we engage and make sure we can connect them with the right places. That's helpful to, to reiterate that. It's not just a one time off, but we really it's do. Not. Well, now let me clear this up and I apologize. We try to use this funding as a one time right. because the federal funds that come in will cover those, but they have guidelines. Mm -hmm. So for those people that fall between that line, that may get turned down, mm -hmm. that they work and they're trying to do what they got to do, but because they may make a dollar more, I've seen it a dollar more, two dollars more not qualified. Mm -hmm. So they're able to say, hey, that's not the end of it. We have another funding here that we can help you with this one time. And we do try to use it this one time, 
But like I said, we, you got to look at it in a person in their environment. So you got to look at it individually. You got to look at it to say, hey, they may need it again. But let us still sit and strategize and figure out how they can make better choices, how they can learn how to do things differently so they can t continue to strive. Absolutely. Thank you. It's good work we're doing. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a point of pride. It really is one for me that when I talk about KUB, the fact that we have social workers <laughs> on our staff uh, that we pay for, the ratepayers pay for, because we think it's a priority. Right. And uh, that's, if I understand, when I first joined the board, that was a relative, it was a rare thing. Mm -hmm. Most utilities don't do things. I assume it's still the case. Yeah. So. Commissioners, as you were introduced, we got some new line, line work for apprentices. Uh, we, the program just started a few months ago. We're kind of got, got through the first phase. I want to introduce Steve Proffitt, manager of Oberon Construction, to give you an update on that program and the overall apprentice program. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I want to take just a little bit of time to discuss the line work apprentice program and overhead construction. Just a few facts before we get into that. Right now, overhead construction, uh, we're, we're comprised of 22 line worker foremen. We have 14 troubleshooters, first responders, uh, 67 journeymen, and we currently have 14 equipment operators as well as 14 apprentices in the line worker apprentice program six of which are represented here today. They are their first step apprentices that have just recently completed school and, and come back to us from that school. <clears throat> school takes place in Trenton, Georgia now through Southeast Lineman Training Center. A uh, little history on the apprenticeship up until 1997. Uh, apprentices were all trained in-house exclusively. Uh, 97, I was fortunate enough to be a, a part of the first apprentice class that was trained off-site. Uh, we used TVPPA up until 2008. In 2008, uh, the decision was made to, to send the apprentices off to SLTC. Uh, like I said, the, the, the slide says it is 15 weeks. Um, a few of the things that, that they're, they're going to get while they're down there, uh, obviously safety is number one in, in anything that we do at KUB. It's especially critical in the electric industry. There, there's so many hazards, so it's, it's a constant uh, discussion. Constant fundamentally learning as they're going through how to safely perform each task. Uh, their issues, their climbing tools, they're fitted down there as well as the, all the way down to their boots. Uh, they actually leave out on Sunday afternoon and they'll spend four days at Trenton. They, they drive back on Thursday afternoon and then they have Friday and the weekend back with their family, which I guess on a side note kind of prepares them for standby. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, uh, but while they're there, they're, they're going to end up with 500 total hours. They've got 180 of that. It's going to be in the classroom. 320 is, is field training. Talking about electric theory, electric systems. Uh, we've actually had some folks in prior classes, everyone we sent down this, this go around already had their class A CDLs, but they offer that training as well. So as part of that, they can obtain, train, and, and, and get their CDLs while they're on site. Uh, which uh, it, it, it helps us. They, they've got folks down there certified to do that. Um, the, the first four or five weeks is really about learning how to climb, uh, how to use their tools, how to position on the pole. And then they get into the part where they're actually putting those skills to work as they're learning to frame off the pole and pull up wire, uh, the rigging and the hoisting. Uh, all the different things that they, they, they're going to have to use the rest of their career, whether they're on the pole or they're working out of an aerial lift they'll use these skills. <clears throat> I've got a short video. Um, I have a disclaimer. It is a recruiting video, but it does <laughs> give you a little bit of insight into what these these gentlemen will, will be a part of at school. You either do it or you don't. You've told me that you want to do this in your everyday actions. I don't see it. I can help you decide if this is for you or not. You may not have what it takes. Here at this school, trust me, it's a tip of the iceberg on what you're going to experience out there in the real world. It's not for everybody.
So just as a comparison and, and the difference in the apprenticeship and how it had, has evolved through time, uh, when, when I went through the apprenticeship with TVPPA, we were at climbing school for one week. Uh, the next consecutive year, we went back for a week at a time to do some underground labs and overhead labs work. These gentlemen are so much better prepared uh, when they come back from this particular school. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce that, that group of, of folks uh, that you see pictured up here. Kind of hard to tell when they're all geared up, but uh, <laughs> starting left to right, uh, Justin Brown, uh, Kenneth Crawley. Uh, Kenneth actually came over to OHC from our transportation department. Got Ryan Holloway. Ryan came from underground construction over to overhead. Zarek Howe also transitioned from underground to overhead. I've got uh, Justin Locasio, which is pictured in this, and then between Zarek and Justin, I've got Derek Kellogg. Derek took a little bit of a, a different path to get to us. Tennessee College of Applied Technologies has started a line school in Oneida, Tennessee. Uh, it's even longer than 15 weeks. They're, they're up there for five to, to six months, depending, depending on how they progress. But uh, Derek came to us highly recommended out of that school, and he is not disappointed, nor is anyone in this group they are doing doing an exceptional job um, to put their skills to use. So they, they get back from school. We've had them about two or three weeks. Uh, our grid modernization uh, continues to expand. And uh, part of that is setting large structures uh, on remote parts of our system. And then we've got to get electrical backbones built up to those. So these gentlemen, uh, along with uh, some of our training coordinators and other journeymen inside of overhead construction, actually build a, a 10 span line uh, no truck access they were using pickup trucks and utvs they climbed every pole uh, and did a phenomenal job but we've got uh, we've got zarek and, and derek here you can this is at the the northern most part of our system on a road by the name of cracker neck valley a uh, beautiful view once you finally get up there to the top as you can see in some of these photos uh, you can see forever up there but just some, some photos of these guys and them utilizing the skills, the things that they've learned in climbing school and that they've brought back and, and assisting us on the system with. Here we've got Justin Lacasio and Kenneth Crawley. Uh, everybody climbs in pairs, uh, working, working these poles out. Can't talk enough about how great of a job in talking to the instructors at SLTC when we went down for graduation. Very complimentary of this group. Leaders inside of every one of their pole climbing groups. So we've, We've been excited about that. We've got, uh, I believe that's Ryan uh, there on the bottom and Justin Branham on the top and you can kind of get a, a better feel for the view of that where they were working at. Uh, working in the clouds that day, it was terribly tough that morning, so good day to climb. Uh, this is that group that helped. Uh, pictured right in the middle right there is Keith Patterson, which is, is with us today, and Dwayne Thorne. There are two of our foremen that are also training coordinators. Um, once they get back to us from SLTC, it's, it's OJT as well as some labs that we go through there on Hoskins Center where they're, they're learning some skills as they progress through their apprenticeship and then a, a host of, of journey uh, that were there to assist with this project as well. But it was a major undertaking. It's not often that we build that much overhead and, and we're climbing those things. So. Certainly appreciate the time that they spent with these guys, helping them get better. Uh, our, our apprenticeship program is set up into five levels. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot is, well, how long does it take? It's roughly a year per level. Uh, these six gentlemen have been with KUB almost a year, including their time at climbing school, and they're, they're being evaluated currently uh, to move to second step, which will introduce them to secondary voltage, uh, being assisted by a journeyman, but we, we have an advisory committee uh, that's made up of Eddie uh, Newman from Human Resources, Brian Jordan, overhead supervisor, also program coordinator, our training coordinators, which are Keith Patterson, Dwayne Corm, and Brian Martin. Uh, and and we, we sit in on these committees, <coughs> committees uh, our apprentices fill out weekly evaluations, that last bullet point there. They're filling out an hourly spreadsheet weekly talking about the task that they've done and how much time they've spent for that week doing it. Our foremen are also tasked with filling out an evaluation skills form each week for these apprentices where they sit down and they talk about the things they've done and how well they've done those. Those all funnel back through the, the program coordinator, uh, Brian Jordan, and we, we document all of, all of that 
Um, and then we're, we're, we're looking for progress. Uh, you know, we're looking for them to build each and every day on what they've learned and applying that out in the field. We do have uh, module training that they will go through. They, they receive the first module at SLTC. <coughs> And then uh, Keith and the other training coordinators will help them and, and navigate them through modules two, three, and four through those steps of their apprenticeship. That's part of their competencies to move on to the next level. Once they move to third step, that's where they start uh, being introduced to primary voltage work, obviously with the journeyman in the bucket with them. Um, but that third step's a big one. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of different when you start touching those things you've been told your whole life not to. <laughs> so we take a lot of time uh, and make sure this, this picture to the right is actually one of our fourth step apprentices now, Al Grimes, but when they move to third step, we, we simulate energized equipment in the back and we have our journeyman talk to them about proper cover up and, and minimum approach distances and body position and things of that nature just to prepare them for that step in into this this part of the work. Um, we have the modules, we have the, the evaluations, and we have some skills testing out back. Uh, we recently, this past October of 2019, we had four of our apprentices that achieved uh, journeyman lineman status there. Left to right, Keith Patterson, training coordinator, Cody Blaylock, Jeff Howard, myself, uh, Kenneth Wu, Brian Mims, and Brian Jordan. I would at this time like to recognize Brian Jordan and, and Keith. They're instrumental in our apprenticeship uh, committee. They're instrumental in, in getting these guys on the right path and making sure that they they get to this monumental time, which is which is being a, a journey in lineman and overhead. It's time I take any questions if you have any. So first, I just want to say congratulations. It is a phenomenal show. And, and and my second my second comment is it seems like a few folks left underground to go to overhead. So in your estimation, is it a better work environment to go in open? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 so I'm good. Yeah, it's, it's just a, it's just a change of venues. Is this one of the most dangerous things that you know? I mean, is this one of the most dangerous jobs? Nationally, it's still considered it. it typically goes back and forth between the 10th and 12th most dangerous jobs in the nation. Yes, ma'am. Did you all know that? <laughs> <laughs> you know it on purpose. <laughs> but, I mean, I, it's, it's really just even watching the video and yeah. seeing how much athleticism, how much, you know, you have to think all the time, you have to be fit. I mean, I'm just imagining these things. I could never do it. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know if you have any women, line women. Not yet. Yeah. Um, Not yet. But, so as far as, you know, you go in the program for 15 weeks, how many people actually graduate or does is it you know does everybody graduate no no man yeah i would think maybe not attrition is pretty high in the first couple of weeks uh, sltc usually runs three classes a year we'll start with 220 uh, uh, students and and they have about a 10 to 15 percent attrition rate on that. Mm -hmm. so um, we we've been very blessed all of our folks have done exceptionally well we've had some class presidents we've had some that have won some other awards uh, for that entire group of 200, so it, it bodes very well uh, for our process of bringing good folks in and, and getting in a position to be successful. Yeah, I was just sitting here thinking that there's so much that we take for granted and just turn on the lights. Mm -hmm. You know, all the stuff that goes into um, getting us just electricity is uh, phenomenal, so I can move you forward. Thank you. Yeah. These, these gentlemen and the others in overhead, as well as all the utility workers here, it's, it really is a lot to sacrifice, and they understand what they're signing up for, but, you know, we, we do our best to talk them out of it, uh, <laughs> to see if we can, but we're, we were not very successful, but I couldn't be more, more proud to be associated with such a great group of folks. That's awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And the only the only job we have that's more dangerous are the customer relations people who have to deal with angry customers. <laughs> Di different type of danger. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, uh, we are, are now at a point for public comment. Do we have any members of the public who wish to address the board today?
All right. Uh, Mr. Kent Minow? And you will have, you've been with us before, but as you know, you'll have five minutes to make your comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Nice to see you all. And uh, congratulations to people who've gone through the, um, this apprenticeship program. I really appreciate your service. I know how hard it is. I used to teach part of the program for your counterparts in Los Angeles. So uh, again, congratulations to all of you. Uh, my comment today is about gas. And I've sent you all an article um, and the gist of the article is that, and this article came out yesterday, the uh, gist of the article is that the natural gas infrastructure is about 40% more dangerous to the climate than previously thought. And the previous thinking was that it was already pretty darn dangerous because of methane, the main component of natural gas, about 90 times more of a climate disruptor than carbon dioxide. Um, well, I submit the article to do its own work um, and read it. It's about six minutes, but um, <clears throat> to, the, to the end of the article, my family and I have gone and we just installed a, an, an electric induction stovetop. We called KUP, had them remove our electric meter, and a truck came out and abolished the pipe. And I said, the guy on the phone said, that's what we're doing, abolishing the pipe. And I went, what does abolish mean? What it means is that the pipe is now disconnected both at the house and at the other end out in the street at the main gas pipe. We're disconnected from all fossil fuels in our home now. And this kind of thing is happening all over the country. There are many towns, counties, especially in California, that are mandating through their building codes that any new construction have no gas hookups at all and be totally electric precisely because of this reason. It's interesting because the first meeting that I came to in this room was in December of 2018, and I heard an excellent presentation by Mike Ballin about the pipe rupture in Smith County. And there were a couple of things that I still remember to this day about it. One was that the volume of gas escaping under pressure from that pipeline, it was so intense that it made a screaming sound that in this sparsely settled area caused temporary hearing loss in, in residents. I come from LA, as you know, and I was a neighbor of the Aliso Canyon blowout. The point of all this is that our natural gas infrastructure is just so darn leaky that we are, have trouble assessing the amount of methane that escapes from it. And the point of these rules and building codes that I mentioned is that the most important thing we can do is to simply gradually, intelligently, and as quickly as possible, get off gas. And I appreciate your comments where I'm going to ask you about tightening up the infrastructure here in town. And those are important things to do. I very much appreciate you pointing that out. But as you mentioned, tightening it up here in town is nothing compared to what has to be done to deal with the gas that escapes from fracking wells, from other wells that are not fracking wells, and from the larger pipes and infrastructure, and the pipes burst all the time. So I'm asking for a policy change on your part. Um, and it's difficult for me to say this, because I just heard this excellent <laughs> presentation about gas expansion. And the point of my remarks is that that's going in exactly the wrong direction. The truck that came out to my house, and they did a great job. Employees of KUP are just fantastic. And when they were abolishing the pipe, I noticed on the back of the truck there's a little sticker that advertises a rebate for doing away with an electrical appliance and replacing with a gas appliance. And the policy recommendation I'm making to you here today is reverse that. Go in the other direction so that when people do what my family has done is to get off fossil fuels altogether. There's a bit of a rebate in that, because I'm not asking for myself. We were able to afford it, but it's a pretty penny. The induction stovetop ain't cheap. <clears throat> and uh, I think by so doing, you would start to take the intelligent and long-term approach necessary to deal with the climate crisis. Utilities are ahead of the rest of the country in dealing with the climate crisis. 
the amount of carbon emissions that come from utility-generated electricity have plummeted over the past decade. And I've been proud to be involved with the advocacy in that. But the, we still occasionally hear the delusion, and I've heard it a little bit in this room, that gas is clean energy. I think it comes from, uh, you know, when you, if you're behind a bus that burns diesel, and then the bus changes over to gas, and, you know, when the gas-powered bus takes off, well, you're not behind a cloud of black smoke. But from the climate point of view, this is and the point made in the article, gas is <coughs> worse. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Nice to speak with you again. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, before we adjourn today, uh, I want to call attention to the timing of our March meeting. It's going to be different than in other months. The meeting will be held on the 2nd Thursday of March rather than the 3rd, and that date will be March the 12th. Uh, the meeting will be held at noon, and this information has been included in prior public notice, and the schedule is posted on KUB's website. So just want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. Following the adjournment of the meeting, the board will have a lunch session across the hall that is open for the public to observe. The meeting is now adjourned.